today I think a lot of us are talking about our journeys, what makes us passionate, uh, you know, where our passion is and everything like that. And before I go into my presentation, I'll just tell you, I had this crazy idea. Um, well, it started in about 92, 93, but uh, that really GDP was the wrong measure of progress for nations. That, you know, it's really just having just a, a crude measure of how much money a nation makes. It can't be the best way of measuring progress in the 21st century. Well, it was the 20th century then. And I followed that train of thought. So if any of you have had a, you know, a great idea, don't forget it. You know, keep following that train of thought. You know, how could we measure progress better? And that led me into doing alternative indicators to GDP in the 90s. In 2000, I set up a group at the New Economics Foundation, which is a think tank on how we can measure progress better. It became the Center for Wellbeing. I got very, very interested in happiness, well-being, the experience of life. What's our lived experience? How can we create measures of our lived experience rather than just the conditions of life? And just following that logic, following that idea through, uh, and obviously sometimes you have to do other things, but it's like keeping that idea going through. So if you've got a great idea, uh, stick with it. So right now, taking those skills that I've done, uh, that I've used for you know, quite a long time and honed over a long time into the business world, like how can we create metrics of happiness of, uh, at work and the experience of work? And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. But it's a morning and the sun's just come out and I think it's always good to reach for one's heroes in life. So uh, here's Tina. Uh, uh, I mean, woman with big hair and great voice, what more can you want? And uh, Tina obviously very famously said, you know, what's love got to do with it? I don't know if we've got any singers in here today. Anyone want to try? <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> I, can't, I can't sing. And I did ask Lawrence if he could get the music, but you know. Um, and sh she was talking here about, you know, the serious business of her heart. Yeah. Uh, broken relationships, all those sort of things. And, you know, what has happiness got to do with it? What has happiness got to do with a startup? This is the happy startup. Uh, we do stuff on happiness at work. You know, what's it got to do with it? And I want to convince you, I think it's absolutely vital. And when I talk about happiness, you know, and you'll see I'm not wearing my Hawaiian thing because uh, what I'm saying is it's not just this plastic sort of happiness like this. Uh, uh, this very f thing. Happiness is a really, really vital part of our humanity. And, uh, and I want to talk to you and, make it and convince you why it's really, really important. Any of you studied psychology at university? A couple of you. Did you see this picture when you were studying psychology? Very famous picture from 1960s psychology by a psychologist called Paul Ekman. And uh, he took uh, photographs of actors, as it happens, uh, expressing different emotions. His idea, and he's, you know, he's still working today in his 70s, 80s on psychology of emotions. There's someone following his passion all the way through his career. Um, he basically had this idea that we had a set of universal emotions as human beings. And these were across all cultures. And so he took these photographs, and he took these photographs all around the world, and he looked to see whether people with different languages, different cultures, had words for all of these, and they did, even to pre-written uh, language uh, tribes in Papua New Guinea, he took these photographs, they could recognize these emotions and had distinct names for them. So who wants to play Name the Emotion? Okay. Yeah? yeah? What are you going to play? Oh, sorry, we've got Discuss Top Right. Discuss Top Right, yes. <laughs> yeah, any others? Anger. Anger, which one? Top left. Top left, correct. Yeah? Sad, bottom right, sad. So, sad, bottom right, yeah. Surprise. Yeah. Happiness. Happiness, with a very nice gap in his teeth, yeah? <laughs> and, and fear. <laughs> and fear. <laughs> and the point is, if all human beings across the planet experience these emotions, they must have an evolutionary purpose. You know, humanity has not, I mean, I know evolution doesn't invest time and energy and things. It, it's a question of selection and all sorts of things. But we have been naturally selected through our ancestors to express these because they are useful for our surviving and our thriving. They just don't come out. Fear is obviously to do with the flight mechanism. You know, we hear a rustle in the grass. It pays us to be frightened that that might be a tiger. It would not pay us to go, oh, isn't it pretty? 
and be happy at seeing a tiger. It pays us to be frightened, yeah? Uh, if something slithers on the ground, y you know, a lot of you will instinctively, without thinking about it, get fearful because snakes have been dangerous in our, in our evolutionary history. One actually should be much more frightened of electric plug sockets now, but we haven't actually got that evolved hardwired into us yet. But there we, you know, we're going to have much more problems there. So these things happen. Yeah, anger is about a violation of a norm. Uh, sadness is about a loss of a support system. How do we cope with these things? They are very, very functional for us. And the so-called negative emotions, which is, you know, fear, anger, sadness, these sort of things, have been understood from an evolutionary perspective for quite a while about how they're working. Um, but no one's paid so much attention about what the positive emotions are. What are they for? And happiness has mainly been understood as a signal of good functioning. That, you know, I'm happy, carry on. So instead of keep calm and carry on, it's, you know, if happy, carry on, is sort of the, 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 the way it's been understood. But there's been this fantastic new uh, exploration of the positive side of life, uh, mainly led by someone called Marty Seligman in the States, about positive psychology. And, um, and what, what, uh, what are the positive emotions for? And probably the best uh, researcher in this space is Barbara Fredrickson. Um, Barbara is uh, 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 from the uh, University of North Carolina, and she has created this theory uh, which is very empirically based. She is an empirical uh, psychologist, a, a lab-based psychologist, which means she experiments on people, basically. And so she will sort of get half of the room here to sh show you a video of uh, something really nice like cats playing. And she'll show the other half of you something really nasty like cats being run over by cars or split open or something disgusting. Yeah? And so you, she's manipulated your moods and she then experiments about how you perform functions differently, uh, tasks differently. And the, and the big thing that she discovers is over, a, I mean, that's a, such a potted history of a massive career, she's stellar, is that, is that positive emotions broaden our repertoire of responses and actions. They help us do more things. They help us be more creative. The myth of the depressed creative is a myth. There is something which I'm sure many of you heard of called bipolar depression, which is when people go up and down. And some of those people can be highly creative, but they are not highly creative when they're right down in their pits, when they're drinking, when they're lying on their beds, when they're being suicidal, those sort of things. They're not creative then. They're creative when they're on the way up. Bipolar depression is very genetically based and it uh, affects probably just 1% of the population. Unipolar depression is the much more common form of depression in our society, running anywhere, the estimates are between 8 and 20% of the population. And if you live with someone or you've been depressed or you have a friend that's depressed, they are uniformly down. They are not creative, okay? So the point is, is that happy, engaged people are much more creative, which is great for business and all sorts of things. We well, obviously also, if you're happy, you smile. And a smile is an approach goal. A, pro a smile means you can talk to me. So obviously people who are happier are going to build better relationships. If you're always scowling and unhappy, people are going to stay away from you. You're going to give out a force field that says, yeah. So it's like, you know, this doing this. And what she also shows is that over time, this builds our resources, what she calls, basically builds our confidence, our resilience. You know, if we have a lot of positive experiences, you know, we feel better, we expand. You know, and this happens in the moment and over time. So, you know, you're at work, someone says something nasty and barbed to you and you, you know, you shrink a bit. Someone says good and, you know, so in a business context, catch people doing things right. Tell them that they're doing it right because that actually will build confidence uh, uh, as well. And the big take home message really is that positive emotions are about opportunities. Negative emotions are functional, highly functional, but they're about threats. So it's important to survive, but if you want to thrive, you've got to think on the positive side much more. So uh, the next thing to notice about this picture is that we can see what these emotions are. We can read them. So if it was just about my own functioning, my happiness, my <coughs> anger, my sadness was about my functioning, I could keep it to myself. It's useful information for me, helps me function better. But why are these people expressing it on their face? Why can we read that? Because probably, though this is you know, not proven, but probably emotions are pre-language in our evolutionary history. We've probably coordinated behavior as a species through our emotions. 
someone found a bush of berries or saw an animal they wanted hunting, it was really good to be enthusiastic because you could communicate to other people to help you to harvest, to hunt, whatever. So that actually mobilised energy uh, for you to do that. Fear, obviously, if you're frightened, it's better that everyone else picks up that you're frightened because we should be frightened as a group. So we communicate through this. It's why I think, though I don't have evidence for this, but all of us will walk into a room and we can feel something well before we know what's going on in that room. We get a sense of what's going on. Something's up in this room, the tension's here, something, or, you know, we just, there's just a, a vibe and we pick it up. We can't even necessarily put that into language, but we are exquisitely sensitive as creatures to these emotional fields around us. So they're very, very important to us. And you, there's a whole thing, I mean, this is, uh, you know, obviously people laughing together. It actually looks slightly mad if you laugh on your own. If you're walking down the street smiling and laughing, that looks wrong, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> It's a social activity. Happiness is almost a social emotion. It's something we do together in groups. We bond with our happiness and our positive expressions going on. And this is a whole thesis of something which is a great piece of research called Connected. Uh, Connected, they, uh, they draw these maps of social networks. These are hugely expensive pieces of research to do. This is from the Framlington Health Study in the States. They follow people over a long period of time. They know their people they interact with. The yellows and the greens, perhaps it's a bit better to see it, not much brighter, <laughs> um, are all different, you know, good and bad things. They, they've done them for obesity, smoking, uh, all sorts of things where people collect together. Uh, uh, so happy people attract other happy people. Miserable people, uh, one, have less connections, but they also tend to hang out with other miserable people. Uh, but also emotions flow through networks. So very famously, all human beings are supposed to be only six degrees of separation from everybody else on the planet. You know, you know someone knows someone, and then you get to the last person in China or whatever. So the six degrees of separation, it's an exponential relationship as you, as you move out. But happiness and unhappiness travel through a group to three degrees of separation. So your, your happiness, unhappiness affects your friends, which affects their friends which affects their friends. And the third order is still statistically significant effect. It's obviously smaller than the first order effect, but it carries on. So if you think in your organization, uh, in your friendship networks, then, uh, then these things are traveling around. By the way, tip for finding a, uh, a uh, romantic partner is ask your friend's friend for a friend because uh, that's the most likely way that you'll find. So, you know, you ask your friend and say, oh, I've got a friend who's got a friend. That's sort of the <laughs> level that you're most likely to find someone that's sort of like you. And that actually, if you ask for your friend's friend for their friend, you've probably reached out to about 4,000 people, as in from where you are. And, and probably the stats on finding a suitable romantic partner are about one in 2,000 people you'd be compatible with as in genuinely fully compatible with. So it's the, these are networks are very, very useful uh, for all sorts of things. OK, I wanted to say quickly three pieces of great research that together show that happiness is a serious business. Um, the first one is uh, our friend Barbara again. Uh, positive emotions at work. Uh, they did this study in this organization uh, where they had 60 different teams in the same organization. And uh, they uh, looked at performance, yeah? Uh, they already knew how these teams were doing in the key performance indicators for the whole organization, how profitable they were, how the customer satisfaction, the way that they measure performance. And then they looked at their team meetings and they looked at how positive they were to each other or how negative they were to each other. Were they supportive, encouraging? Were they negative? Were they sarcastic? Okay. And they looked at the ratio of positive to negative, what they called utterances. So I think it was about an hour's team meeting they studied. And they put them in this table, high performing teams, medium performing teams, low performing teams. And the ratio is startling. The high performing teams had five or six positive expressions to every negative one. The low performing teams had three negative to every positive. These were very different fields of team meetings. And some of you are quite a bit younger than me, but I imagine that we've all been in different feelings of team meetings. Some are grinding, boring, dull, draining. Isn't it strange how when we're not involved in a meeting, it's more tiring than when we are involved in a meeting. We actually get energy from being engaged and enthusiastic about things. 
And what they showed uh, was that there's this sort of magic ratio of somewhere between three positives to one negative right up to eight positives to one negative, where teams are highly functional. They did show that if you go over eight to one, you also sort of get into a space where you're all a bit happy. <laughs> And, you know, you need some grit in the system. Those negative emotions are functional. It is suitable to be frightened of things sometimes. If mothers were never anxious, not many children would survive. These things are highly functional for us. NASA have a, you know, one of the space shuttle crashes, they brought back down to the culture that too many people were agreeing with each other. There was not enough challenge in NASA. Too many people going, yeah, this is great, right? Challenge is good, grit is good too. Don't, get rid don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. But continually being negative is very, very bad and stifling. That's research number one. Research number two, uh, uh, and the point here really is, sorry, is that the, the uh, Fredrickson and Lasada research is not causal. It is saying that high performing teams are characterized by being happy does not say which way around it is. I want to show you a piece of research which proves that it's happiness that leads to performance more than performance that leads to happiness. Okay, this is from Gallup. Looked at happiness and performance through time. 2,000 teams over time, okay? They looked at happiness at time one, performance at time two. Happiness at time two, performance at time two. Is it happiness leading to performance? Is it performance leading to happiness? Is it both? And what they showed in their model was that they both fitted, uh, but happiness to performance was twice as strong an effect. It's a statistical methodology called structural equation modeling or pathway analysis. It's as close as you get to a proof of causality. Strictly speaking, it's not quite a proof, but it will do. And, um, and the, this is uh, Jim Harter, who's Gallup's head of wellbeing research. This is, I mean, Gallup is not a radical organization in the world, yeah? And he said, these data suggest that the impact of happiness at work on performance is twice as large as from performance to happiness at work. This is, you know, startling stuff. If you want to have a business model based on happiness, this could be a smart thing. Tony Shea at Zappos is a smart young man. And, uh, and what, you know, what he said was he wanted happy customers. He realized the only way to get happy customers was to have happy employees. Focus on the culture, good things will happen. Uh, it, it works, but it isn't taken seriously. Still isn't taken seriously. If you, any of you are looking for investment, are any of your investors asking you about how happy you are as an organization? I doubt it. They should do. Here's a piece of research from, uh, uh, well, this is the provocation really, which is a, you know, in Business Week, which is some sort of rag selling stocks and shares. Um, uh, the management are focused on the employees to the detriment of shareholders. Why would I want to buy a stock like that? Okay, this is the company he was actually talking about, Costco. Uh, uh, I, I have lots of criticisms of big supermarkets, but of course I use them myself, so I'm a hypocrite. But, uh, but uh, whatever you think about them, Costco come in the great place to work list in the US very regularly. Their CEO at this time said, I happen to believe that in order to reward the shareholder in the long term, you have to please your customers and your employees. And this stock analyst was saying, they're focusing too much on employees and not shareholders. Why is he wrong? Well, if you take, look at the stock market and you take all the people in the great place to the work list at time one. So great place to work list is released sometime. Let's say it's January the 1st. Just create a portfolio that invests in those companies, okay? And compare them to the best of sector, to the sector analysis of all those other companies that they should be competing with. And at the end of the year, you've got a return which is between 2.3 and 3.8% higher than their natural competitors in those sectors. Two point, that's 3% higher. I mean, the stock market, that's a huge, huge effect. So these stock analysts, uh, you know, this guy, and I'm sure it's a guy, is, is a fool. His job is to pick people who are going to go, uh, stock, stocks that are going to get better. And he is absolutely missing a piece of information that is vital to that. So if you're going to your investors and they're saying you're focusing too much on your culture, show them this piece of research by Alex Edmonds, and I'm sure people can have the reference to this slide afterwards uh, if they want to, okay? Because it is, it, they need to wake up to that fact. Compounding effect is Yeah, yeah. Over a long period, it's very, very big, the compounding effect. So, uh, so basically, uh, 
We at Happiness Works, you know, we are a startup. Uh, Stu and Bassam and Irena are all here from, uh, from Happiness Works at the moment. Uh, and we're just six of us, and we're basically taking this crazy idea that the business metric of the future should be happiness. Into, and we think that organisations need to get a handle on this. And if they want to, if they want to create happy cultures, then one of the things they can do because is 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 to measure what's going on. So um, we are basically creating fun, easy to use surveys. Any of you can try our survey for free. What it does is it uses new technology and it gives you instant results about your happiness at work so that uh, you can learn. If we want to get into a space where we want to improve happiness at work, then we have to get people on a learning journey about how can they be happier, how can their team be happier. Numbers, as I said, you know, we all feel these things going on. Creating simple numbers is one way of making those feelings more visible, that they can be talked about. That's the trick with numbers. The second decimal place is not exceptionally important here. It's actually, can we just get a handle on this? How can we do, how are we comparing to others? How can we improve? You get lots of charts straight away. But basically the idea is they're easy, friendly to use and everybody gets them at the same time. And uh, some of them are more complicated, but if you want to understand what that model is, you can, I do free webinars every three weeks. Uh, you can sign up for one of the free webinars and I'll explain to you the dynamic model and about how, um, how happiness is really important at work or your friends. Uh, you get breakdowns by team and everything like that. I'll give you two tips. One is that around happiness at work and measurement and anything like that, if you do any surveys, transparency really matters. Don't just hold on to the data yourself. Release it to absolutely everybody. And secondly, it's the conversations that create change. It's not the numbers. Okay, so it's about the discussions you have from results. It's about the changes in your behavior by looking at them. I sometimes talk about the fact that our surveys are like a mirror. Uh, you look in the mirror, you see what is, but they're also like a window because you can see through the mirror to what could be. And that's what you're trying to do is pull people into that space of, of, where, uh, of where you could be. So there's our website, as I say, free webinars, free tri trials and whatever. So um, what would Tina think having heard that? Yeah. Uh, well, I think that if Tina had heard that talk that she would think that happiness is simply the best. <laughs> Thank you.